Right, so Jamie Tivan is our next session. Uh, Jamie is Chief Scientist and Technical Fellow at Microsoft, where she's responsible for driving research-backed innovation in the company's core products. In this session on AI, she'll look back at how the technology has developed, and she'll also be looking forward to consider how we shape preferred futures. Please give Jamie a huge round of applause. Hello and welcome. I'm excited to talk a little bit today about uh, what science tells us about how we can thrive with AI. And, you know, I'm particularly excited to be doing that here at BET because we're in the middle of a uh, generational shift in how people get things done. And educators are at the foundation of ensuring that the world is ready for that shift. So, uh, you know, as she mentioned, I'm Chief Scientist and Technical Fellow at Microsoft, uh, which means I'm responsible for driving research-backed innovation in our core products. And it also means that I've had a pretty exciting year. Um, you know, today I'm going to be talking a little bit about AI and what that looks like. And, you know, sometimes it can feel like that's a new topic. It's been like headlines recently. Um, but if you remember, this shift is actually part of a larger continuum. You know, if you think back just a couple of years ago, we were talking about remote work and remote education. And AI is really just a continuation of that. It's enabled by the rapid digital transformation that the pandemic and the shift to remote work drove, which created new data for training our models. It created new services for us to provide AI support to people. And you know, it, mature, it, it drove a real maturation in the cloud infrastructure that we use to bring these uh, services to people. And they re really required that we think differently about how we use computers to get things done. Um, and you can see this evolution in a lot of places. One place it shows up really clearly is actually in our mission statement. So Microsoft came into existence as a document company. Essentially, we, we, you know, we started thinking about how to help people create and share artifacts with each other. And that shows up in our original mission statement, which is to have a computer on every desktop and in every home to enable that. What's interesting about AI is that it lets us unlock the knowledge embedded in those documents via natural language. So essentially, we're transitioning from being a document company to being a conversational company, whether those conversations are between uh, sets of people or whether it's the conversations that we have with our computers. And that means that our focus is on helping people have great conversations. Like, how do we help people express their intent? How do we help people best share their knowledge and understand things deeply? You know, it's no longer like about the computer and where you want to put the computer. It's about the people. And so that shows up in our mission statement, which is to empower every person on the planet to achieve more. And this is a really big shift. Like, I don't call it a generational shift lightly. And one of the things that's kind of fun is these big changes, they often have like a, a kind of a, a moment, a shared moment that we all remember. And I kind of suspect that the, the shared moment that we have right now is our first experience with this sort of current generation of large language models. So I want you to think about the first time that you interacted with a language model. I certainly remember the first time I did. Uh, it was about a year and a half ago in September 2022, uh, which was, I'll have you remember, it was before 
uh, ChatGPT came out. It was before um, you know people had really knew what uh, GPT 3.5 could do. And I was asked to um, go meet with Sam Altman, who's CEO of OpenAI, and Greg Brockman, and a bunch of other folks from OpenAI to get a sense of what GPT-4 was like and start thinking about how to integrate that into our uh, core products. And I had been playing around with GPT-3.5 a little. Um, I had spent a number of years trying to integrate uh, AI in ambitious ways into our products. Um, and actually, I'd been doing decades of AI research. My PhD is in AI. And so I went into this meeting, actually, deeply skeptical. You know, I sat with like my arms crossed, and I'm like, OK, show me what it can do. AI researchers tend to be some of the most skeptical people about, uh, about this advancement, because it's really a big surprise what's happened. And so I'm sitting in this meeting, and like Greg, who was um, you know, running the demo of GPT-4, you know, he starts showing some of the things it could do. And I'm like, oh, that's a nice demo, but we've all seen nice demos before. Uh, and being an AI researcher, I knew the right kinds of questions to start probing. And it wasn't until after like really pushing on the model and like seeing how it could maintain context as you iterated with it and how it could handle ambiguity and uh, various different conflicting constraints um, and how it could even explain what it was doing that I started to understand the real power underlying that model. Honestly, I was blown away. I was so blown away that actually, um, as I was driving home from that meeting and thinking about what it would mean to bring this into the products, and like I had been worried that it was a bit of a fool's errand, and like all of a sudden I saw it was this huge opportunity. I couldn't even get home. I had to pull my car over on the two-mile drive, pull my car over, and sit in a parking lot. And I sat in my car, and I screamed. And I just, I felt this huge sense of responsibility. You know, a responsibility to bring this powerful technology into people's hands, and a responsibility to do it in the right way. You know, uh, we get the opportunity in the course of our lives to sit and observe a lot of trends, and like certainly that's one of the reasons studying history is important, is to see what's happened and learn from that moving forward. But it's not often that we get to sit right in the middle of a trend and shape it. And that's where we collectively are right now. And so, you know, following that meeting, we began a sprint to uh, integrate GPT-4 into our core products, and I've never seen the company uh, move so fast. But we were only able to move so fast because of decades of research and decades of thought that went into this current moment. And I'm actually reminded of a quote that I really like from the Hagakure. Um, I don't know if you've read the Hagakure. If you haven't, you should check it out. Uh, it's this collection of wisdom gathered from a samurai in the 1700s uh, in the years before he died. So his clerk sort of wrote down his wisdom. It wasn't actually intended to be published, uh, but lucky for us, it was. And there's this one quote in there that I really like, which is, in the words of the ancients, one should make his decisions in the course of seven breaths. And that doesn't mean like be rash and just make willy-nilly <laughs> decisions. It means that you should spend your entire life meditating and reflecting on the decisions that you need to make so that when the time comes and you need to make a decision, you're ready for it. And that's, and that's roughly where we are now. We have spent decades studying and trying to understand AI and its impact on work, and we're ready now at this moment to make that happen. So you can imagine there's been a ton of research at Microsoft and in the academic community uh, to try and understand what, what this will mean for the future of work. Um, you know, and in, di in, in general, digital technology has, um, has been amazing in shaping the way we get things done, but it also creates a lot of digital debt. Right? The pace of work has increased 
from the crush of data, overload of information, and the always-on communication. Um, in fact, research shows it takes 25 minutes to get up to full productivity. And yet we're interrupted every three minutes. And even when we're not un interrupted by external sources, we're like constantly distracted. We self-interrupt to go like check email or check social media. We actually only look at a given desktop window for maybe 20 seconds. And so it's not surprising that people often feel frazzled in a recent survey that we ran with over 30,000 people across a variety of different countries and different job roles, uh, we found that 64% of people reported struggling with finding the time and energy to get things done. And those people who were struggling reported being three and a half times more likely to struggle with innovation which is particularly important right now, is that we are innovating and thinking about new ways to do things. And so the question is, is AI going to make this worse, kind of increase our digital debt, or is it actually going to help us? Can it actually unlock uh, new ways of working and new ways of thinking about things? It's quite a different technology. Um, and so there's been a lot of research starting to emerge in the past year on this. Um, Early studies have actually shown a surprising impact on uh, productivity. So for example, there was a study just out of MIT earlier, earlier last year uh, by Noyan Zhang looking at using ChatGPT, which is GPT-3.5, uh, to write essays. And so they had a couple hundred people write essays uh, with ChatGPT and without it and compared it to their performance prior. Um, and what they found was that people were a lot faster doing the writing tasks, actually quite a lot faster. So the writing test took 27 minutes without ChatGPT. It took 17 minutes with ChatGPT. That's 10 minutes shorter. And then what's more is the quality of the essays that they produced actually went up with the, uh, people receiving higher grades. And so that's with uh, ChatGPT, GPT-3.5, early, early on in this journey. And we've been doing a lot of studying as well of Copilot, which is Microsoft's version of uh, integrating large language models into our, uh, into our products. Um, actually, it's kind of interesting. You know, everybody understands how deeply we are in the middle of actually like figuring all this stuff out. I've never seen our customers get so engaged around doing research with us as I have uh, recently. So as our early adopters are trying out Copilot, they're like filling out surveys, they're helping us study and understand things. Um, and they're certainly reporting being more productive, they're reporting being faster. 72% of all people said it was less mental effort on mundane or uh, repetitive tasks. But that's self-report data, so as a scientist, I actually really like to look at the behavioral data as well and how we see actual behavior changing. Um, so we've run a bunch of studies on a handful of common tasks trying to look at the um, actual changes in speed, quality, and effort underlying that. And we've looked at a bunch of different common tasks. Typically, like, so when you think about what a language model is good for, Language models are good at generating text, so they're great for the sort of blank slate kinds of problems, starting something new. Um, they're also really good at, um, at sort of translating concepts or ideas. So they're good at summarizing, taking a long, long document and translating it into something shorter. Actually, like the blank slate generating stuff, that's sort of a translation problem as well. How do you take uh, a few notes about what you want and translate that into more formal uh, writing? And uh, what we see is that people are 29% faster overall when running on these kinds of tasks uh, that they're good for. And in fact, you save a full 32 minutes summarizing a meeting with Copilot. I actually use that. Um, I use that a lot myself. And like, 
These tasks, and, uh, as the thing that I would um, want to know in particular is that these tasks are the tasks that AI is good at. Um, you might have seen this recent paper about BCG consultants um, about the jagged technological frontier. Uh, it's talking about sort of those tasks that research suggests um, are going to see really good early wins. And in that study as well, you see similar things. Uh, people were 20% faster doing tasks within that jagged frontier, producing 40% higher quality uh, results. So one of the things I encourage you to do as educators is to think about which of the tasks in the work that you do fall in within that jagged, jagged technological frontier that you, can, uh, that you can start taking advantage of language models and seeing wins like this in the work that you're doing right away. So LinkedIn ran a, a study where they analyzed where and how generative AI was going to change a bunch of different specific roles, looking at what skills uh, AI could help with and what skills really required um, a human or a person uh, to do. And in the context of education, they found that about half of the skills that teachers do uh, require humans directly, you know, and that's stuff like classroom management or uh, differentiating in instruction. But 45% of a teacher's job could benefit from help from AI. And that's things like lesson plannings or curriculum development. And I want you to think, if you could figure out how to get up with that, how would you use that extra time? Like, what new opportunities would that open up? Because that's really the opportunity right here. We've got sort of the skills that language models are going to be very good at. And then we've got the opportunity that that creates. And so, um, you know, that's a little bit about how the role of the educator is going to change. But obviously, the, you know, the experience of our students is going to change as well. Um, and we need to be thinking about how and what uh, students are going to learn and what skills they need to sort of thrive in the coming world. I have um, four boys at the end of the K-12 journey couple graduating college, uh, high school this year and entering in college, one in college, another in high school. And so I think about this a lot. Like, what do they need to know uh, to be successful in the world? Um, and I sometimes worry that maybe we're teaching kids the wrong skills for the future. And I think that in part because when you look across these studies that I was talking about, about um, where AI really makes people more productive, one of the interesting things that you see is it actually closes the skill gap really significantly. I mean, and this suggests to me that we're teaching the kids the skills that AI can do versus the skills that are going to complement AI. Um, so that Noy and Zhang study that I mentioned, for example, one of the things they found was that ChatGPT reduced grade disparity by half. And the BCG study, that I mentioned when they looked at the impact of generative AI on the lower half of uh, participants, they found that there was a 43% improvement compared with a 17% improvement on the upper half. You know, so what does it mean when every student is a B plus student? Like, that is great. That means our baseline is raised, but we need to think about what the skills are that people are going to need moving forward. So um, when we survey business leaders, a lot of the skills that they're asking for are ones that help people leverage AI. You know, you have to spend the, take the time to learn how to leverage AI, how to write great prompts, how to evaluate the output, how to evaluate creative work, um, how to check for bias and understand the answers that you're getting. You know, these are the new core competencies. There are things like analytical thinking, complex problem thinking, uh, creativity, and originality. And you know what's interesting about these skills? It's not like they're, they're, they're not, they're skills that we've always known as are important. They're metacognitive skills. 
They're the skills we need to think about how to think. And as AI gets good at like the production of content and making things happen, like that's what we need from people. And generative AI increases the metacognitive burden. It becomes increasingly important for people to do the planning and monitoring and evaluation of the work that happens as much as it is to actually do the work. And so like, the task becomes one of critical integration. We're moving from you know, thinking about things like searching and creating to actually analyzing and integrating that work. It becomes really important to think early on, how do we express our intent? What are we looking at? What are we thinking about? And then later on, you know, how do we understand the results we see? And so these are like new things to be thinking about. Um, a topic that comes up a lot that I'm sure you've heard about is over-reliance. You know, over-reliance happens when somebody, you know, a human place, places too much trust in the results that an AI system uh, provides. And if we think about our metacognitive processes, we can actually start to address over-reliance. Um, so, for example, it's really great to develop cognitive forcing functions to force yourself to reflect on the results that the system gives. You know, you should, for example, Ask yourself, do you agree or disagree with the content that an AI system provides? Or rate your confidence in the answer. Those sorts of things will help you do a better job in working with AI. And so we can teach these to people. We can practice them ourselves. And we can also then go build them into our tools. Um, and as we do that, it actually re requires thinking about what our AI tools are a little bit. Up until now, a lot of the conversation around how to use AI is like thinking about it as an assistant. How does it help me write better? How does it help me do this better? Um, and actually, there's this opportunity instead to think about AI as a provocateur something that asks us questions and makes us think about things more deeply and frameworks that structure critical thinking, like Bloom's taxonomy, inform the design for AI and help us build that critical feedback cycle into our products. Um, you know, my favorite use uh, for a large language model is actually very specifically about thinking about the kinds of questions to ask. So when I have a um, document that I'm trying to summarize. In addition to like getting the bullet points and summarizing the document, I ask the language model, what questions would a researcher interested in AI and productivity have about this article? Or if I'm going to write an email, like a hard email that I'm worried about how it might land, I actually ask the language model to help me think about how different stakeholders will respond to that email. And we're building this into our tools as well. Um, so if you're using Teams Copilot, uh, it's pretty awesome in that it will, you know, we talked about the 23 minutes that get saved uh, summarizing meetings. It's pretty awesome in terms of summarizing meetings. You join a meeting late, you can get caught up, you skip a meeting, and you know what you missed. Um, but some of my favorite features there are actually, if you look at the prompt suggestions in the middle of a meeting, they're actually intended to spark good conversation. You know, there's prompt suggestions like, what are the points of disagreement in this meeting? What questions should we try to answer before we wrap up? And like there, that's not just helping us do our work faster or more efficiently, but it's helping us actually think about things in a new way. And so like, these intentional things that we build into our tools are actually what are going to help AI change the way that people learn and think about things. I mean, even think about something as simple as spell check, right? You know, like you can use spell check, and as you're typing and going along, it can auto correct uh, what you're doing. And, and this happens, like, you know, with typos, you're going along and, like, sort of on autopilot, the system will just fix what you're doing. But you can actually learn 
if instead you get cues in line that help you understand the, the mistake that you made, you know, that you can actually see that you misspelled it, see the corrections in, in context, um, and learn from that. And, just, and that's, that's essentially what takes the experience from being one where, you're help, where the system's helping you on autopilot to something where it's your co-pilot and helping you learn and grow. And just like with spell check, we can create opportunities that encourage learning and that improve learning outcomes versus simply finding the easiest solution. Uh, in one of the uh, very first randomized experiments on large language models in education, this is a study out of um, Microsoft Research in the University of Toronto. Uh, they, we found that large language model-based explanations actually uh, positively impact learning over just giving people the correct answer. So the study gives people a bunch of multiple choice SAT style questions. I think they're math questions taken directly from the SAT, actually. Um, and there's sort of two phases to the study, a, um, a training phase and then a test phase. And in the training phase, people are given a question like this. You know, this is a standard, like somebody drives one direction at a certain speed and drives back at, a, at another speed, what's, what's the average speed that they travel at? And the answer here, just to make it easy for you, is B. And so like some students during the practice session would see this, while others would get LLM-generated explanations for how to think about uh, and solve these problems. Um, you know, and actually, on the left-hand side, what you can see is one that's generic, generated by the language model, and on the right-hand side is an explanation that's actually generated explicitly with the intent of serving as a tutor or coach uh, for the individual to help them learn. And what they found as, they, uh, as um, they had people take these practice tests and then looked at the performance on a set of test questions, uh, was that um, explanations significantly improved the outcomes. So when, they were, when people were given only the answers during the training session, they got like slightly more than half of the answers in the test session correct. On the other hand, when they were given these LLM-based uh, uh, explanations, over two-thirds of the time, they got the answer correct. And there's a ton of detail in the paper that's worth digging into, and, and including like timing of the interventions and stuff like that. Um, but the important thing for us is that these improvements are a result of the intention that's built into the system. The LLM is essentially serving as a coach or a tutor for individuals so that they can learn better. And we're taking this emerging research and we're building it into our products so that our products aren't just helping people on autopilot, but that are, are truly serving uh, as a co-pilot. And I've talked a little bit about this in terms of things like how, it, how, it's, how, we're, how we're doing that in the context of teams uh, and our horizontals. Uh, we also have a set of verticals that we're thinking about explicitly in, in education, the Microsoft Learning Accelerators, which provide students with real-time coaching and feedback and educators with actionable analysis and insights. Um, there's a couple of examples here that I really like. Um, Reading Coach is a great example. It actually like, uh, uses large language models to generate choose your own adventure style stories for students to read, um, and then uses AI to provide feedback on like reading fluency and vocabulary um, and surface that up to, to their teachers as well. Um, another one that's super relevant to this conversation is actually the uh, search coach, because the search coach actively teaches metacognitive skills like we were talking about. Like it teaches people how to formulate a query and plan what they're going to be searching for, how to identify and find trusted sites for information, and how to understand the quality of the search results. Um, and What's particularly exciting is that technology like this is going to allow the learning to scale in a way that we haven't seen before. Um, and so there was a recent study also, a case study out of Harvard that you might have seen, looking at the uh, use of AI in the classroom. And um, 
you know, with the goal, like it, it was for their intro CS course, which is a huge course and it's very hard to scale. Um, there's actually a real uh, dearth of sort of computer, computer scientists to teach those intro CS classes. And um, what they found was that the students were felt as if they had a personal tutor in this class. And so like, it's, our, it's our opportunity and it's our obligation to figure out how to use these, to these tools to bring personal learning into the classroom and think about how we're going to use that extra time in new ways to develop new approaches to education. And hopefully I've provided a little bit of the sort of scientific background that we need to understand AI and future of work for, for us to do that. Um, you know, and I think that's actually, a, it's actually an important point where if you think about it, there's a bunch of unknowns. There's a lot of ambiguity that we're headed into right now and a lot that we need to figure out. Um, but fortunately, there is a model for that. There's a model for that that the folks in this room are experts at, and that is the scientific process. We need to be teaching our students the scientific process and we need to be using it ourselves. Like, we need to be leading like scientists. And that, of course, means developing experiments and hypotheses and testing them out, but there's so much more to the scientific process than that. It means building on the state of the art, like not making everything up from scratch, reading and learning, and, and, and uh, you know, building on what others know. It means sharing what we discover so that others can build on what we know, and actually, also, so that others can disagree with what we're doing. And it means vigorous debate and validation. Like, that's a big part of the publication process, is actually validation of what you've done. And it means considering the externalities and thinking about the long-term impact of what we're going to do. And, you know, I think together we can use these scientific principles to create a new, equitable, productive, inclusive future with AI. And you all are on the front lines of helping the world, you know, deal with this generational shift. And you have the opportunity right now to shape education for the better. And I'm really excited to see what you learn. So thank you. <laughs> Sorry. Uh, a huge thank you to Jamie for that session. Uh, we're going to race straight into our next session, but we're sticking with the theme of AI. Um, and it'll be Kay first Butterfield, who is CEO of the Good Tech Advisory. Kay will be taking to the stage next. The company